Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. The European Union and China sparred over geopolitics and economics on Monday when the heads of the bloc's main institutions held video conferences with the Chinese Premier and President. EU criticism of a Chinese plan to curb Hong Kong's autonomy, allegations that China has spread disinformation about the coronavirus and frustration over Beijing's curbs on foreign investors featured prominently in the talks. The atmosphere has become gloomier since the last EU-China summit in April 2019 when both sides pledged unity in the fight to uphold the multilateral order being challenged by US President Donald Trump's America First agenda and the Europeans claimed progress in urging the Chinese government to pursue fairer economic policies. While that meeting 14 months ago produced a much-hailed EU-China statement, no joint declaration emerged from Monday's deliberations. Also, unlike last year, the Chinese side on Monday opted against a joint press conference with the EU. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the tensions between EU and China. Joining me on the program today are Mohan Kumar, former ambassador, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, foreign editor of the Hindustan Times, and Professor Gulshan Sachdeva, Center for European Studies, JNU. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, I'd like to begin the program with you. What are your initial thoughts of what went down on Monday between China and the EU? So thank you very much for having me on the show. I think it's fair to say that uh, all is not well. Uh, for me, more than the virtual summit, it is Angela Merkel, German Chancellor, who has invested heavily in the relationship. And she set great store by the Leipzig summit, which was expected to happen on September 2020. And remember that 2020 was also supposed to be the year of EU-China relations. So now I understand that China has requested a postponement of the Leipzig summit, which was scheduled to take place in September 2020, which Angela Merkel will take it as a very personal affront, frankly. So I really think EU-China, the areas of differences are widening, and we can get a little bit into it if you like, but I would uh, flag just at this stage that there are human rights issues. There is an investment uh, agreement that was going to be negotiated and finalized by September 2020, which will now not happen. And you've got WTO reforms on sustainable development China's greenhouse gas emissions are plateauing at 2015 level. They are refusing to upgrade their intended nationally determined contributions. EU is very unhappy about that. So I can only see differences. We can get into it after your other panelists speak. The only area of agreement is the Iranian nuclear deal. Apart from that, every other area, and we can talk about it as I said, differences have widened between EU and China. Okay, all right. So since we're talking about differences, uh, Professor, you know, what are the three biggest contentious issues as far as you are concerned between the EU and China and what is it that tops the agenda for the European Union? Well, in fact, you know, I think we also need to go slightly beyond the headlines. Uh, you know, both uh, China and uh, EU they are both economic heavyweights. They have their influence within their own regions and perhaps even beyond. Uh, they also both have global ambitions. And in fact, we also need to understand they are also very deeply engaged with each other. If you look today, you know, if you look at the you know, goods and services trade happening between Europe and China, it's about 640 billion euros which is something, you translate something about $2 billion worth of goods and services being exchanged between EU and China every day. And they do have very strong institutional mechanisms. It's not just only strategic partnership, but also China has strategic partnerships with all major partners, not just in the Western Europe, but also in Central and Eastern Europe with Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Greece, with uh, you know, Serbia, etc. And then, of course, we also have 17 plus 1. Uh, so, now, if you look at, in fact, all the earlier documents, both released by China and also by the European Union, 
except for the last one, which, you know, the March 2019 one where EU said that, you know, China is economic competitor, systemic rival, etc. Uh, now, as I think Ambassador Kumar has rightly mentioned, in the last two years, uh, the mood has changed. Uh, the areas of disagreements are uh, becoming more and more. Uh, particularly now, at the moment, Hong Kong was one issue, not just only because of, uh, uh, you know, uh, normative issues, but at the same time, you know, 50% of, uh, you know, European investment, you know, rooted via Hong Kong. And a lot of, you know, more than 15, 1600 companies are based actually in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong obviously has been one issue. The way, in fact, the coronavirus issue has been tackled by uh, China and the lack of transparency, etc. And Europe, as you know, was, you know, very badly hit by this. Uh, but how to really deal this now issue and particularly how you have economic recovery, because as I said, both are also very deeply engaged with each other. And third issue, of course, is about, uh, you know, the market access uh, within uh, for, for European companies in China, because, you know, uh, China has been negotiating this investment deal with China from 2014 onwards. Uh, there's a, I mean, there's some, in, I mean, kind of movement, but still, in fact, you know, they haven't really come. So I would say that these are two, three major issues, uh, transparency right, right. within China and uh, Hong Kong issue and the, how you are going to actually revive global economy. And uh, other major differences, of course, about human rights, about democracy, etc. But, you know, they, they, they have been there from the very beginning. And I think both China and the European Union, the kind of 50 plus dialogues they have, I think they have been able to somehow manage this, both of them, from their own, for their own satisfaction. And, you know, interesting thing also one need to understand, if you look at all the papers, in fact, you know, China never considered Europe as something really rival. Because in the 2003 paper, which came from China, you know, uh, when they signed strategic partnership, what China said that there's actually no ma major basic disagreement between China and the European Union. Uh, and then they don't really pose threat to each other. But now what we see, uh, you know, even after BRI, in fact, you know, European Union was not really so uh, kind of, I would say, uh, very much against this because it was basically about infrastructure, about regional cooperation, etc. Sure. But in the last two, three years, I think ambition within Europe is to become more geopolitical. And I think in those geopolitical ambitions, they feel that perhaps China is also becoming slightly geopolitical threat to Europe. So okay. All that's right. how Pramit you deal since, with it. Yeah. So Pramit, since we are here, uh, let's talk about what has changed over the last 14 months. You know, from April 2019, when there was... Uh, a fairly successful summit to now, June 2020. What has changed and what is different this time around and why is the EU taking on China at this juncture? Well, the EU, somewhat like the liberals in America as well, had their, have their own China fantasy. And that China fantasy, very similar to what America had, used to have even just about three or four years ago, uh, was effectively that the more you engage with China, the more you bring China into the multilateral system, the, make, the richer, wealthier China gets. Eventually, if it may not be a democracy, but it, it will be what is called a responsible stakeholder. It would, be, it would learn to rein in uh, a lot of its communist authoritarian activities and its actions overseas would become more or less aligned with that of the rest of the world. Professor Sachdeva mentions, for example, there are 50 dialogues with the European Union. They also have 30, 40 dialogues with the United States, and it didn't make any difference in the end. Uh, and the United States realized this uh, by the second term of the Obama administration, that China was going off on a completely different path, that the entire Deng period, period up to Deng, up to Xi Jinping, uh, China had been slowly liberalizing and be acting responsibly. Afterwards, under Xi Jinping in particular, it has in fact begun to rip apart almost every agreement uh, that it has or undermine them uh, internally or externally. And of course, be become territorially aggressive, like a 19th century European, 18th century European power uh, in a way that, uh, that they had hoped that would not happen. Um, the American now, if you, the, there is no difference now between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and the people that could see Biden bringing on board. There's now a clear consensus in America that the China fantasy is now a China nightmare. The European Union, partly because in my view, they're not geopolitically particularly, uh, uh, should we say, uh, realistic 
about what happens in the Asia in the Asian sphere is still debating this to some degree. Um, and you can see the split within them. Uh, Germany, as has been mentioned, because of its, it has the largest economic stakes uh, in, <clears throat> in uh, China, uh, is particularly reluctant to do this. There's an additional factor that the alternative to China, which is the United States, the Germans have become the hate figure with the Trump administration. As clear, Angela Merkel is probably the most disliked world leader uh, by Donald Trump, and I think it's mutual on, on the other side. And so there's a, a, a problem there, especially with the Americans uh, and, and the Germans in particular. The French, I would argue, have been the most realistic about China, especially when you talk to their officials, they're very clear that they realize that the, the game is over as far as China is concerned, but they don't know exactly how to wean themselves, if you wish, off of China. Um, and as Professor Sejdeva said, China itself has now built spheres of influence within Europe. Uh, Italy, for example, uh, some Central European countries. But on the other hand, a lot of like the Nordic countries, Sweden, uh, for example, has become the, has, has had an almost run, non-stop running battle with the, with the Chinese and a whole host of fronts. Norway as well. The Nordic countries now are among the most hostile. Uh, Britain is not a member of the European Union and also tried to hedge its bets with China, but now you've seen they've just given up, they're throwing Huawei out of their out of their system. So this is the European Union, because of the nature of the European Union, will always take a longer time to recognize or come to a consensus internally. I would argue the trend line is relatively clear. Some years right. ago, I was talking to the German Foreign Secretary about his relationship with China, and he says that and he said you know, off the record, he said, I'll be frank, the Chinese will talk to us nicely for now because they need us for machine tools, certain types of technology and investment. Once that ends, and that is ending quite rapidly because of the, de and he said himself, the degree of theft that the Chinese are doing of our technology, at that point, China will no longer care what the European tell Union tells them or even how much money they make from us. Mm -hmm. And I think we're moving very close to that position, but the European Union hasn't yet crossed that line. Okay, all right, since we are here, Ambassador, let's talk about, uh, you know, what options the EU really has. You know, considering that China is, uh, you know, EU's second largest trading partner after the United States, you know, at, when it comes down to economics, what options does the EU really have? This is something that you touched upon, and this is something that the professor also highlighted in his opening remarks. So, uh, it is true that uh, the European Union suffers from two disadvantages. One, um, whatever the EU decides at the level of Brussels is not binding on member states. And I will refer to two things. One is a guidance paper that the EU has come up with on foreign investment. And the other one is on 5G, what they call critical technologies on both the EU has come up with guidance papers for the member states because of the complex way in which competence is distributed between Brussels and the member states. It is not binding on the member states. That's the first. The second, of course, as you said, is clout. I would point to Germany having a disproportionate influence on economics. 43% of EU exports to China is Germany. 18% of imports from China into EU is just Germany. And 5,000 German firms operate in China. And almost 25,000 technologies have been transferred to China at a value of almost $100 billion. These figures are big. And, China, and Germany looms large, frankly. Every other state is actually a pygmy when it comes to relations with China. So Germany is going to play an important role. I would say that 5G uh, state subsidies, one of the things that EU has done recently is to say that we will also make sure that domestic EU law on state subsidies will be made applicable to China. As you know, EU is extremely concerned about Chinese state subsidies, the state-owned enterprises in China and so on. And in the WTO, 
EU has also been extraordinarily interested in what is known as excess capacity, excess industrial capacity by China. So uh, answering your question, Frank, I think the EU is not toothless. I think it would be wrong to say the EU is toothless. And I think the EU is waking up, albeit belatedly. The EU has two problems. One, as I said, not all member states are on the same page. I would say Portugal, Italy, Greece need Chinese investment. But I would say even they are waking up because post-COVID, even Italy has realized now the disadvantages of having Chinese investment. The other area where I think the EU will do something economically is what is known as reshoring of some of these important essential items like masks and personal protective equipment. I think it will take time because the dependence on personal protective equipment and masks is extraordinary. And even uh, 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 Sanofi, for example, in France, has said their vaccine center was going to be based in France. So I don't think EU likes the fact that they are dependent on China. So there will be some steps I would say, I would finish this segment by saying, I think China is biding for time. And that is why they postponed the Leipzig summit. China wants to see the outcome of the US elections because China doesn't want to make some concessions to Donald Trump now and then one more time with Joe Biden, if that happens. Uh, so I don't think China wants to do that. China has done the same thing, by the way, with Japan. They have put on hold all summits with Japan until early next year. So a lot of things will hinge on the American elections, and then you will see China playing its cards. So I would say to conclude that EU does have a few, um, uh, shall we say, cards up their sleeve. And you will, you will see that slowly. But as uh, Pramit said uh, very rightly, and I agree with him, everything in EU takes time. And that, that is a bit of an issue for them. But I do believe the mood is shifting against China in EU today. Okay. All right. Talking about cards and talking about options, uh, Professor, sanctions, do you believe that they, at some point in time that the EU is going to consider, it, consider them or is it out of the question really? Well, sanction for what? I mean, uh, I don't Economic think... sanctions. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, that's the way um, EU functions and uh, sanction, but you know, I, I don't understand your question. Sanction of what, in, in case of what? In case of Hong Kong, in case of BRI, I mean, sanction against what? You know, sanctions as a whole, you know, let's talk about BRI, Hong Kong, you know, multiple options really as far as the EU is concerned. Well, I mean, in that sense, yes. I mean, I think Ambassador Kumar was absolutely right that EU is waking up. And the way uh, the institutional mechanism is within the EU institution, it does take time. So we would see some results coming, uh, how EU is going to deal with, the Euro uh, with China in the years to come in bits and pieces, not perhaps in one kind of stroke it will come slowly and slowly because they, we also must understand they have huge capacities, but at the same time, they also huge linkages uh, with Chinese companies and also with the Chinese economies and then also global linkages with other players like yesterday, e, I mean, United States and the EU, they have decided to have dialogue on China. Perhaps we can also have, you know, since we also have a very strong partnership with the EU, we can also have perhaps a new dialogue on China with the European Union uh, against Chinese BRI. I mean, not exactly that they would say against, but exactly Europe has also started its own uh, Europe-Asia connectivity strategy, uh, but at the same time, they are also working with the connectivity platform with the uh, with China for the last many years. So there are many ways in which now Europeans, you would see slowly and slowly would try they uh, they'll try to kind of squeeze China from different angles with other partners because this is the way the European Union functions. They will work with the United States, they will work with Japan, they will work with India. So this, in sense, is a good opportunity for us because normally. Within the Asia-Pacific, uh, within the Indo-Pacific scenario, we haven't really looked at the kind of role which the European Union and Europe could actually play in favor of us, because we always thought that Europe is really economic player. Now they are becoming more and more geopolitical and also, you know, kind of waking up to Chinese threat. Uh, it's not that, you know, that I mean, they were not geopolitical. It's not that the Europeans do not know geopolitics. Geo I mean, geopolitics as a subject originated in Europe and they were the colonizers of the whole world. So they know how to play it, 
Only thing is that the last 50, 60 years of the European project, it was on a different kind of principle. But now I think there is a clear ambition from the European side, and particularly this European Commission, they would like to play not just only a you know, larger role in the global affairs, but also more geopolitical role. And this is exactly... I mean, in a very fit case where European can play some geopolitics here, you know, but, you know, this is, a, you know, there are, there are, of course, uh, economic compulsions and there are also differences of all 27 countries. In fact, you know, after Tiananmen Square, when, you know, all the arms embargo was there against China, you know, in 2004, 5, 6, I mean, Germany, France and some other countries, they were even willing to even, you know, sell weapons to China. I mean, those, I mean, it was only because of American pressure, they couldn't do it. So now... There are economic interests, which are also very, very real for the many European countries. And there are also certain investments which are coming from uh, uh, from China in some parts in the Mediterranean region, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and some of them are not really so bad. So in fact, but at the same time, compared to the kind of investment which is coming from Europe, other, I mean, major countries in Europe to Central and Eastern Europe, Chinese investment is still very, very small. So still really they can't play that kind of role within Europe. And there are rules of the game. Uh, yes, uh, the competencies are, uh, you know, very much clear, but in certain right. economic matters, on trade and investment matters, I think the competencies are very clearly within the European Union, so they can really play a very important role there. So I think uh, what one can see now, uh, the way uh, European Union, you know, works, it takes time, it will be in much more methodical, you will find results of that, and I think there's an opportunity, as I said, for India to work with the EU on China, broadly in geopolitical front and also on specific issues, whether this is connectivity, whether this is trade, whether there's something else, where we can really work. And I think this is a, the way, in fact, now the Europe is kind of waking up to this. We should take advantage of this because European is also looking for partners here within Asia. Okay, talking about partners and talking about partnerships, uh, Pramit, you know, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has called on, uh, you know, the United States and the European Union to cultivate a shared understanding to confront China. Do you see that happening? Yes, I think so, because as I said, both of them are now moving towards, or should the European Union, uh, most of its members are now moving to a view of China that is not completely dissimilar to what the American position, as I've mentioned, has already evolved into. Um, I think the, the problem has less been about their recognition of what China has become or is becoming uh, as much as the fact that the U.S., especially under Trump, had complete contempt for the European Union. And it was noticeable that until now, Pompeo's conversations, uh, his, his meetings globally about the post-pandemic world, he has focused on the Quad. Every single meeting he has held, whether it's with countries like Brazil or Israel, or South Korea and so on, the Quad has been the core of his vision of the post-pandemic world. NATO is not part of it. He never mentions NATO. He does not hold meetings in which NATO is part of the post-pandemic structure. Um, this is the first time we're seeing a recognition, and in fact, often his meetings with the Europeans have been actually quite abusive uh, in his, his uh, speeches, where he basically says, you people need to wake up, you're, you're hopeless. Uh, there's still a lot of, as I said, anger with the Germans, particularly over the fact that they refuse to spend almost any money on their defense. Uh, and a strong sense, and this is not just a Trump thing, Obama had the same position, that the Germans basically free ride off the American security structure. Um, that is now shifting, at least. So I think there's a recognition, at least by the Trump administration, that you can't do this on your own. You have to bring the Europeans on board and the European, as we discussed, have their positions have slowly shifted, largely because of Chinese action rather than because they've been persuaded by the Americans. Um, but my sense is, again, when I've talked to European diplomats, is that they're desperately hoping Joe Biden becomes president of the United States in November or January, uh, because then they will be in a position to actually move much closer to the United, or back to the United States. Uh, after almost, you know, almost, let's say, uh, five years of, of uh, a, a, an almost, a set, uh, should we say, a divorce uh, between the, the two sides of the Atlantic. Um, and that Biden, at least, will allow them to, because he will support multilateralism, even though his positions in China will be almost identical to Trump. Uh, but also 
Trump, Biden is fundamentally an Atlanticist. He will take Europe seriously and believes Europe is there. I mean, the point that about what's interesting about Pompeo saying that we have to work out a non collective understanding of China is that in the past, America and Europe, you wouldn't even have to have a discussion on this. You wouldn't have to say, oh, look, after all this time, we're now going to sit down and try to work out a dialogue. Right. Um, this the, the the relationship has divorced itself so much that they actually have to go to something. I mean, India and the U.S. talk about China on a regular basis, uh, and my sense is they talk more about the U.S. Uh, we talk about the, with China with the U.S. more often than the U.S. is prepared to talk with the EU uh, about China. And this is a shift, and it's a good shift. But the real change is going to have to take place. Uh, the Europeans are hoping it'll take place after uh, Biden is elected. Okay, all right. Time now to get quick closing comments from all my panelists. I've got three minutes left, so giving you all one minute each with the best way forward. All right, Ambassador, starting first with you. What do you see happening in the near future? I think uh, regardless of the American election, and I agree that if Biden wins, I mean, the Chinese are on record as saying that they would rather have a Trump re-election for obvious reasons. But my sense is even if Trump gets re-elected, I think the mood is shifting against China, especially in three areas. One, strategic investments, I think, will be screened much more in Europe now. The era of China coming in, just buying the family silver is over. Even in Portugal, Italy and Spain, I see the mood shifting. Second, in the area of essential goods and services like personal protective equipment, vaccines, masks, there will be some reshoring and there will be some break in value chains. And thirdly, I think uh, one needs to watch very carefully what happens in the WTO. There is a leadership vacuum and there have been some candidates, but I would be very surprised if the WTO does not next year start looking at two things. One, state subsidies and secondly, it looks at anti-dumping and other trade remedies. The non-market right. economy of China continues. WTO, I mean, EU and US continue to treat China as a non-market economy. And I think that trend will get reinforced as well. Thank you. OK, all right. Professor? Well, in fact, you know, uh, uh, earlier, when they signed strategic partnership, it was kind of uh, labeled as a partnership of the century because two major players. But the honeymoon was over very soon. But now what one what is seeing in the last uh, two years and particularly now in the last few months, there is a lot of suspicion uh, within EU about China and the capacities they have. They can really squeeze China in certain ways. And I think India should really take advantage of the European suspicions about China and build certain partnerships in which we can really work and uh, you know do certain counterbalancing within Asian uh, kind of theatre uh, because we never took Europe very very seriously as for a, a, you know vis-a-vis -vis China. But now I think no. the time has come and Europe is also perhaps getting ready to this. And I think we should take advantage of this and not just only in connectivity, but many, many uh, other areas. So there are options, more options for us now in the coming years. Right. And Pramit, close the show for us with your quick concluding remark. Well, I think one of the things that uh, Professor Sachdeva and, and, and Ambassador Kumar hinted at, which I think is also important to recognize, that part of the EU-China relationship, a smaller element, is going to have to be an enhanced EU-India relationship. Uh, we were supposed to have a summit. Uh, um, there was a plan for the, our prime minister to visit uh, Europe sometime uh, this year. You saw the foreign ministers and uh, the EU high representative exchange um, notes, if you wish, uh, on in preparation for that. Um, mm -hmm. A new concept of a new central European policy. We've already had a Nordic summit. Plans for a Visegrad summit were being proposed. So there was a broad idea that we would, and part of the reason for that relation, new, new enhanced relationship, uh, and you can see this in the EU-India strategy paper, is the issue of China. Um, and that's right. another element of this, which unfortunately the pandemic has now obviously put on hold. 
Okay, all right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of the Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things in perspective for us. Well, the differences between EU and China have clearly widened, is what the panelists are suggesting, and it could be an opportunity for India to step in and really uh, try and fill the void. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time.